So good morning again to those who are sitting. Good morning for the first time, those of you who might be joining us now. And these mornings that I'm sitting here teaching for the next last week and this week and next three weeks, the theme are the five faculties, usually have what they're called in English, the five indriyas. And last week I talked about the first, faith. This week I'll talk about the second, effort. And uh, I want to say something about these, this word indriya, uh, faculties. Sometimes in English it's called the five spiritual faculties. Occasionally I've seen it translated as the five controlling faculties. The name of these five qualities comes from the in, name of the Indian god Indriya, Indra. So Indriya means something like of the god Indra. And Indra, in the time of the Buddha, was the kind of the ruler of the gods. And he was considered to be a friend of human beings, friend of the Buddha. And... Um, And in some degree, this ruler of the gods had dominion over them or controlled them or the celestial world. And uh, so to call these five faculties, five qualities, uh, capacities, abilities that we have, to associate them with the god Indra, the great god, ruler of the gods, is to give them a fairly high regard And uh, maybe it would be appropriate in English to uh, translate them as the five divine faculties. And what I like about this kind of language of divine faculties is the great respect it offers to something that's found within us. That the human abilities that we have to engage and be present for things uh, uh, is... um, is somehow very special, it's celebrated, it's valued in a great degree, that we find treasures within ourselves, something that's considered divine. And these divine faculties, abilities we have, can be our friend for almost anything we do, they come along. And they also have uh, some kind of uh, supportive, I don't know if we want to say controlling, supporting quality, helping things to unfold or supporting the unfolding, the doing, the activities we're involved in. So faith, to have faith or confidence in what we do, to have make effort, to be attentive or mindful as we do it, to be focused and steady or concentrated as we do something, and to be wise or discerning. These are the five divine faculties we have. And today's faculty is, uh, this week is uh, effort, virya. And um, effort is a very important quality of practice. And one way of understanding the course of Buddhist practice is that it's a continual effort or continual finding right effort. That uh, what's the right effort, how we make effort, changes from day to day, hour to hour, sometimes minute to minute. And being attuned to that uh, and knowing how to flow and move in and out of the, what effort is needed is part of the art of practice. Uh, it can, uh, the word effort can be, some people will hear it, immediately be reactive or feel like it's a burden. It means like effort has associations with hard work and, and um, needing to prove oneself or do something different, be something different than what we are, or something. But they, hopefully, as the people developed in the practice, the idea of effort becomes a delight. It becomes second nature, it becomes easy, it becomes something that we're well attuned to and understand all the ins and outs of it. 
and that we appreciate it as something divine. We appreciate it as something valuable that we have. And there are, uh, uh, I'm going to, this during this week, I'll talk about five different qualities of effort because the quality or how effort is uh, manifests changes in the course of time and over practice. The first uh, form of effort for today is, um, I think of it as initiating effort. The effort it takes to initiate and begin doing practice, Buddhist practice, doing meditation. And um, without some effort, we won't sit down to meditate. Without some effort, we won't go on a retreat. Without some effort, we don't bring up the mindfulness to pay attention to what's going on. There has to be some initiating effort. And that initiating effort is um, sometimes is easy. We have a tremendous inspiration, just really excited about the opportunities to sit and meditate and have effort there and engage and we're very wholeheartedly involved. So I feel so lucky that we get to do this. And other times it's really hard. Uh, there can be a lot of inertia. There can be a lot of resistance. There can be fear around stepping down. There could be a lot of laziness. There could be a lot of uh, momentum to do other things, almost anything else but to sit quietly and meditate. And uh, sometimes it takes a lot of effort. Uh, you know, maybe like manual labor to kind of get oneself to sit down and just sit down to do nothing or to do very little and be quiet. Um, and to do it regularly makes sex effort. To get up in the morning and decide I'm going to sit. To, um, and to be mindful through the day uh, when so many other things are compelling and want our attention. But to initiate, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to engage in it. And this, so what it, the initiating effort is one that gets done over and over again. And we can see that clearly in meditation especially when people are relatively new to this or the mind is somewhat agitated and been busy day, that uh, a lot of meditation is just starting over, initiating again and again and again. The mind wanders off and we come back. The mind wanders off, we start again. I like the language of starting again because every time we start is its own wonderful thing. If we have some idea that we're trying to maintain continuity and then feel discouraged when the mind goes off, that becomes kind of a burden for meditation. But whenever we notice we wandered off in thought and we're no longer mindful, to have this very open, generous idea that we're going to sit now as if it's the very first time, that we don't have to carry with us the burden of what has just happened. We're allowed to start fresh as if this is the newest thing we're doing. Okay, I'll start again. And it might be in a session of meditation that starting again is done a hundred times. Uh, it's done over and over again. And that's not wrong. It's not a mistake. A tremendous amount of good comes from all those little moments of starting over, of initiating the practice, making the effort to show up and be present again, to be here. Every moment of doing that is a redirecting, retraining, reconditioning the mind. It is a letting go and weakening the forces of distraction and preoccupation that have been strengthened sometimes over a lifetime of um, uncontrolled uh, you know, engagement in them. It's actually a powerful thing to stop the habitual, step away from the habitual, compulsive way the mind operates to be present, to be here with the present moment, with what's going on, with what's obvious. And then, um, just that is great. If you can sustain that over time, great. But don't underestimate the power of this initiating effort. And sometimes when I've meditated, uh, it feels like meditation is just a lot of manual labor. Uh, like when I'm sleepy and mind is kind of busy and distractible that um, uh, it's really hard to be present and I have to kind of keep coming back, keep coming back, keep coming back. Start again, 
start again, start again. And, um, and depending on circumstances in our lives, it might be a lot of effort to start again, keep doing it, keep showing up, keep letting go. And um, so the initiating effort, the effort it takes to get to the cushion, to go on a retreat, we have to do a lot of effort to go on a retreat, to organize our life, to get bus tickets, and take the bus to wherever we're going to go, and you know whatever it takes to get there. Um, and uh, and some of that effort, you know, to get to the cushion, to get to show up, um, is part of the practice itself. Especially if you give care and attention to how you sit down to meditate. That you don't do it, hopefully, as a burden, as a heavy duty. But maybe you make your meditation place kind of beautiful. You uh, Maybe the way the few minutes before you meditate are quite important. You don't rush to get finished everything you possibly can so it's all you can meditate and sit down meditating out of breath. Perhaps the meditation can begin five minutes before you sit down. Just as you begin to kind of take care of things, settle things around in your home, um, be a little bit calmer in what you do, so that when you come to sit, that effort to slow down, that effort to be calm and to be here and preparing yourself for it, then the effort to sit is a little bit easier. The effort to sit is a little bit more harmonious. So a lot of effort is the initial initiating effort. Eventually, uh, we don't have to initiate so much. Eventually, we kind of start being in, in the flow of effort. We're able to kind of sustain it. We're able to stay awake uh, more continuously in our experience. and We stay here. And as we begin to stay more fully in the experience uh, and able to maintain that to some degree, then effort begins to have different shape. Different kinds of efforts are needed. And... Um, and we can ask ourselves the question, uh, which was the first question I asked a Buddhist teacher, my, my first Zen teacher. We can ask ourselves the question, um, uh, what's the right effort? And finding our way to the right effort when we're able to engage and stay engaged is a really wise question. And how to answer that question is the, the discussion for tomorrow. But for now, I want to tell you a little story of uh, that first question I asked my first Zen teacher. I had just been introduced to Zen and to Zen meditation. I was attracted to doing it. This is something I wanted to do. The teacher had just given a Dharma talk and had left the, the Dharma hall. And I walked up to him and I, and I was 20 years old. and you know, This is 45 years ago. And I asked him... Um, um, what's the right effort for doing Zen meditation? I don't remember much about why I was asking it or what I understood effort to be or even what the word right effort is, but I remember asking him the question. And he gave me uh, what would be for some people a wonderful answer, but it wasn't wonderful for me <laughs> because I just wasn't... I was so new to all this, to Buddhism and all that, and so, you know, I just didn't know how to understand the question or make any, any sense of it at all. So I think I probably internally just shrugged my shoulders and just kind of let it be, and it really made no impression on me. But still, it was a kind of a wonderful answer. I asked him, what's the right effort for doing meditation? And he looked at me, and he said, Who's making the effort? That's all he said. Who's making the effort? So as we go through this week looking at effort, uh, we'll look at different aspects and what the nature of right effort is. And, and perhaps there's a way in which the question, who's making the effort, can free you, can free your effort so that it doesn't carry the burden of self through it. May you enjoy your effort this week. Thank you.